Okay, this is a video of section two, test two. Test two, section two. You can fast forward to the ones that you need help with. I'll try to go quickly on these so that the video isn't too long. And also, you may wanna watch the whole thing in case you um, just wanna see the way I do it versus the way you do it. So let's get started here. If I can make my page go, here we go. All right, so you'll notice on the SAT, first of all, they're gonna give you these formulas here. You should have all of these memorized. There should be no reason that you go back and have to look these up. So most of them are simple. We're going to talk about the special right triangles in class in a couple weeks. So let's start here with number one. All right, I'm just going to be doing the straightforward approach to most of these. So in a sequence above the first term is one and each term after the first is two more than twice the previous term, what is the value of t? Well, it tells us right here that the next term is two more than twice the previous term. So we want t, so we take twice the previous term, so the previous term would be 10, and it's two more than 10, so it's gonna be 20 plus two, so the answer is going to be 22. So that one was pretty simple. Try not to make too much out of it. The, previous, the next term is two more than twice the previous. Okay, it gets a little bit harder here. A machine can fill 24 cartons in one hour. At this rate, how many cartons can it fill in five minutes? Now notice here we have hour versus minutes. You have to translate either the hours into minutes or the minutes into hours. It's easier to take the hours and change it into 60 minutes. So let's do that. So 24 cartons can be filled in 60 minutes. At this rate, how many cartons can the machine fill in five minutes? Hold on a second, I lost control of my pen. There we go. Okay, so we wanna know how many it can fill in five minutes, so we wanna know in five minutes. So you make yourself a proportion like that, if it's 24 in 60 minutes, how many in five minutes? So we can just cross multiply. Um, what I did, I just divided both by 12 because 60 divided by 12 is five. So I'm gonna divide this by 12 and we're going to get two. So two in five minutes, so that answer is two. There's a lot of proportions on this section of the test. So um, if you don't know how to do proportions, hopefully you'll learn it a little bit better here. All right, let's move to the next ones. All right, this one says the gra line graph shows the number of cars Kathy, uh, I can't read that word, in each of the first sold in first six months of 2003. <clears throat> so Kathy sold how many cars in the month of May than in the months of January and February? So you track it up here and you figure out month of May is 48. How many more? So we're going to subtract off it what she sold in January and what she sold in February. You can put that in the calculator pretty easily and you're gonna get 48 minus 38, you don't even need a calculator, and your answer is 10. All right, let's um, go down. This one's a little bit harder. This one says, if the car sales data from these six months were illustrated by a circle graph, what would be the measure of the central angle of the sector that represents the month of April? Okay, anytime they're talking about angles in a circle, we need to think out of 360 degrees. So the first thing we're gonna do is figure out how many, we're gonna add up, um, we have to know how, much car, how many cars they sold all together, and then we have to figure out um, how many um, in April out of how many all together. So we take all our numbers that we have, so we're gonna have 20, 18, 22, 30, 48, and 42, whoops, 42. We're gonna add those up, and when we do that, we get 180. April, let me slide back up here. April was 30, so out of the 180, 30 out of 180 were in April. See another proportion problem. 
Now, when we're talking about um, central angles, we're talking about measures of the circle in a circle graph. A central angle is going to be out of 360 degrees. So we're going to say 30 out of 180 equals what out of a circle? So you don't even need to draw a picture here. You just need to figure out 180 goes into 362 times, 2 times 30 would be 60 degrees. So the, the thing to keep in mind with this one is if you have a circle graph and a central angle, just use this out of 360 degrees. So our answer to that one is 60. Okay, back up, moving rather quickly here. This one's a kind of fun one. All you have to do is rotate it counterclockwise 90 degrees. So you can take your book and rotate your book 90 degrees and see what it looks like. Or you can just look at the picture and try to find the one that matches what it looks like when you rotate it. So if I rotate this 100, and if I rotate this 90 degrees, this part right here is going to be at the top of the um, figure. So the top of the figure should look like one bump, one bump down, four bumps over. So this one, if I rotate it, has two bumps. That's not going to work. This one doesn't have any. This one has one and one and four, and this one has one down one and over four. This one doesn't work at all. So now we have to look at the bottom of the graph if it's rotated. This is the bottom. I mean, I'm hoping that most of you just got this, but not everyone can see these. So this would be two up one over three. So here we go. This one is two up one. I don't have quite control of my pen today as I normally do. So this isn't going to work, so the answer is going to be D. Hopefully that's easy to see. Just take your book, turn it 90 degrees, so that this is on the top and this part's on the bottom. That's how you rotate it 90 degrees. Let's keep moving here. Okay. Um, this is a pure algebra problem. I don't think there's any way to do it faster than just to take and translate it into an algebraic equation. So three more than twice a number is equal to 10. Very simple algebra one problem. So we're going to get 2n equals 7, n equals 7 halves. Whoops, did I just mess this one up? Um, let's see, subtract 7 equals 7 halves, which is, oh yes, <laughs> okay. I am about ready to uh, do this problem wrong, so I'm demonstrating why I almost got it wrong. If I would have just gone for n, I would have got 3.5, which would have been this answer right here. But I forgot to read the problem. It says, what is 4 times the number? So these are, part, these are why these SAT problems are harder than they should be. So now we have to take 7 halves times 4, and it's going to go in. 2 times, so we're going to get 14. So our correct answer is 14. Be on the lookout for these kind of things, because you can see they had the wrong answer all waiting for me if I didn't multiply it by 4. So they have the answers designed for you to not read the entire problem and think you got it right. Okay, if A is less than 0, if it's less than 0, what do we know about it? If it's less than 0, it's a negative number. So which one is the greatest? Well, if you don't know, pick a negative number. Pick negative 1. Put it in. Negative 1. Negative 2. Negative 4. Negative 8. Which one is the greatest? Well, it's going to be the one that's A. If you take a negative number times a number, it's going to get smaller, not bigger. So the answer to that one is A. You can always just pick numbers and see if you don't can't see that without numbers. Okay, I'm moving along here. The area. This is an easy one too. Let's just divide this into two shapes. So this, the bottom shape is actually a square. If I could draw a straight line. So the area of that would be four times four times four is going to be sixteen, and the top shape is a rectangle. The length of the rectangle from here to here is going to be two. And then we know that this is also 4, so that's going to be 6. And we know that um, if this is 6 and this is 4, then this has to be 2. So it's going to be 12 plus 16 is going to be 12 plus 16 
is going to be 28. There isn't really anything tricky about that one. Not too bad. Okay, next one. If x minus 2 quantity squared equals 25 and x is less than 0, what is the value of x? Well, all our choices are less than 0. You could solve it, and the way you'd solve it is you would FOIL this out and set it equal to 0, and then factor, and you'll get two answers, and you have to pick the negative one. Or you can just take your answer choices. Start with negative 5. Put negative 5 in. Negative 5 minus 2 is going to be negative 7 squared is 49. It doesn't work. Too big. Move down. Negative 3 minus 3 is going to be negative 5 squared is 25. So this is going to be your answer. If you want to see how to work it without putting your numbers in, that's the easiest way is to just put these numbers in. You can tell these are going to be the ones that would work. Here's the correct way. You FOIL it out. So you get x squared minus 4x minus 4 equals 25. Set it equal to 0. x squared minus 4x minus 21 is equal to 0. And then you would factor it. Um, this should have been a plus 4 foiled wrong. You factor that and you get x minus 7, x plus 3, and you would get x equals 7 and negative 3. It has to be a negative number, so you cross this one out and you get negative 3. But you can see it's a lot easier if you just substitute it into this problem. Okay, onward. Alright, number 10. This is another ratio one. It says in the figure, what is the value of PT? So here's PT right here to PS. So PT is the base of the smaller triangle. PS is the base of the larger triangle. If we think of a larger triangle out here like this, here's our larger triangle. Now the thing with these two triangles, here's the larger one. Let me just go and do the the smaller one in black. These two triangles, what you have to know is that they're similar triangles. Similar triangles have to have at least have three congruent angles. And you can you know that there's three if there's two. So we have this one and this one are congruent in these two triangles. And it also shares this angle. It's in the black one and in the orange one. So when the triangles are similar, the ratio of the sides are all going to be the same. So we have two sides. We have QT and we have RT. So we know that QT over RT has to be the same ratio as PT. Make sure I get these right. The little one over the big one. Um, let's see, did I, I colored in my numbers? Okay, RT. The little one. QT is the little one, PT is the little one, okay, over PS. So we know QT is 8 and RT is 10, and that has to be the same ratio as PT over PS, and when we reduce that, we get 4 fifths. This is the only one that is in the, the same ratio. So similar triangles, all the sides have the same ratio, all the corresponding sides have the same ratio. Okay, getting harder as we go. Biology teacher graphed the graph of fish over time. The results are shown above. If L represents the length of the fish in millimeters, W the weeks. Which of the following equations describes the data shown? Okay, you have to find the equation of this line. You can take and um, make a line. Um, I'm not very good at getting a line going through points using this little tool that I have, but I'm going to approximate here. So there we go, kind of comes through there a little bit. My line is really bad here. All right, so you're going to draw your line through it. My line looks like it hits through 0, 0, so it actually is, is bad because it's not going to end up going through 0, 0. Hmm. Well, maybe it does go through 0, 0. Let's see. I haven't done the problem yet. All right, it looks like it does. Okay, the way to do this problem is they have equations of the line, and you have to see which equation of the line it is. 
So if you know anything about lines, you know that this, the slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. And we need to find, um, yeah, <laughs> you can almost see how it goes through 0, 0. I mean, I couldn't even draw it not going through 0, 0. So that, b stands for your y-intercept, and that's going to be the number added on to the ends. Now, if there's no number added on to the end, that means your y-intercept is 0, that it goes through the y axis at zero. So, I mean, even just looking at my graph, I would eliminate this one and this one because it's not going to go through at 10. So the only thing we need to do now is find the slope. So I'm going to find the slope. It's the rise over run. So it's going to be how much it rises from one point and runs to the next point. So let's just do from this point right here to this point, let's calculate our slope. So we're going to rise, and it looks like we're going to rise up from 10 to 30. So our rise is going to be 30, and our run is going to go 1, 2. So our run, 3. Let's see, it's going up. No, our rise is from 10 to 30, so it's going to be 20. Sorry. So our rise is going to be 20. Our run, this is going to be 20. Our run is going to be 2. So our slope is going to be 10. So the only one where it has a slope of 10, it's the number before the x is your slope, is going to be d. So that's it. The other way to do it is you can just start picking points. If you don't understand anything I did, go here, pick a point. Let's pick this one. This point looks like it's about 7. We know it's 7. And right across here looks like about 70. This is your x and your y or your L and your W. That's actually the other way around. The weeks, the weeks are seven, the length is L. Put them in. So the first one, L cannot equal W, so that can't be it. L does equal 10, but it doesn't tell you, tell you anything about the um, W. If we take W, which would be seven plus 10, we do not get um, 70. And if we do D, if we put L in, 70 equals 10, the weeks are 7 um, times w, which is 70, it actually works. So you can just pick points and substitute them in if you don't understand how to do the slope-intercept form. Okay, these things, um, oh, let's, we have to do this one here. For the numbers listed above, the only mode is 5, and the value in the median is 6. Each of the following could be the value of n except. So, so the first thing, whenever you see these ones with median or modes, range, whatever, put them in order. So we're going to go 5, 5, 5, 5. As I write them, I like to cross them out so I don't miss anybody. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 6s. 6, 6, 6. 1, 2, 3. And then we have 7. So we have n, and we have to decide what n can be so that the only mode is 5 and the median is 6. So it says each of the following could be the value except. So um, I'm just going to start with 6 because it's really obvious. If I put 6 in, I'm going to have two modes. Mode is how often a number repeats. 5 is the mode in this one because it repeats the most. If I put a 6 in here, I'm going to have two modes. And it says the only mode is 5. So if I put another 6 in, now we have two modes, so this cannot be an answer. I mean, it cannot be true, so that's the one because they said accept this one. So the key with these median mode range ones is you need to put them in order from least to greatest, and then just try to figure out where you're going to put this number so that it makes sense. Um, the 6 doesn't work because then we would have two modes, so that would mess that up. All right, number 13. These are interesting problems. In the Venn diagram, I've seen these before. The number in each region indicates how many elements are in that region. How many elements are in the intersection of y and z? Well, the whole idea for this is get rid of everything with x. Let's just highlight the z and the y. Okay, try to forget about the x out there. Where do we have to see where the z and the y intersect? Well, it's going to be at 2, 3, and 7. 
whoops, um, actually these don't intersect. They're only going to intersect right here, 3 and 7. So if you take them out, the best thing to do for these is just take them and draw them over here on the side, like that. This one has a 2, a 3, and a 3 and 7, and this one has the 4 and the 5. So the only place where those two intersect would be 10. The numbers that intersect would be 10. So totally, it messes your mind with having some of these other numbers in it. So just totally draw it and leave out everything that would be in the X that doesn't interlock, intersect. All right, next one. Hope this video is not getting too long for you. Okay, if M equals T cubed for any positive integer, integer T, and if W equals M squared plus M, what is at W in terms of T? So when it says in terms of t, that means leave t in the answer. So we're going to substitute. We want t in the answer. So m equals t cubed. So I'm going to replace all the m's with a t cubed right here. I'm going to take, and I'm going to, instead of m squared, I'm going to put t cubed, which is now we're substituting that in for m, but then we still have to square it. m is equal to t cubed, so I'm putting that in. And we get w equals, just, just when they say w in terms of t, that makes the problem sound a lot more complicated in, than it is. So we're going to get t to the sixth plus t to the third. This is um, w in terms, this is what it's equal to in terms of t. So it's going to be t to the sixth plus t to the third. All right, our first symbol problem. This is a rather um, time-consuming problem, seeing that we only have a minute to do each problem. Okay, so it says that x triangle equals x minus 1 times x plus 1. So that means every time you have a number in front of the triangle, you substitute the number in for x. So if you have a number in front of the triangle, you substitute that number where the x's are. So let's try this. So we have, uh, the first one we have is 6 triangle minus 5 triangle. So we're, instead of the x, we're going to put the 6. So we're going to have 6 minus 1 times 6 plus 1. And that's going to equal 5 times 7. Make sure I get this right. 5 times 7, which would be 35. And then we have 5 triangles, so it's going to be 5 minus 1, 5 plus 1, which would be 4 times 6, which would be 24. And if we subtract them, we get 11. Now, we have to see which one of these here would give us 11. So we're going to start with C, just because that's how we do it. So we're going to get 4 triangle. Let's do this real fast. So 4 triangle would be 4 minus 1 times 4 plus 1. And 3 triangle is going to be 3 minus 1 times 3 plus 1. We're going to be adding them this time and not subtracting them. So it's going to be 3 times 6, which is going to be, whoops, I do that wrong. 3 times 5 is 15. And 2 times 4 is going to be 8. So 8 plus 15 is not going to give us 11. It's going to give us 23. So we need smaller numbers. So I'm going to go up to the next one. So 3 triangle, now that's kind of cool. We already have 3 triangle, right? So that's going to be 8. I don't need to redo that one. We just need 2 triangle. So here we go. 2 minus 1 times 2 plus 1, which is going to be 1 times 3, which is 3. And if we add those up, we get 11. So B is going to end up being the same as this original. And that's how that works. We're getting there, guys. There's a lot of problems. 
All right, um, x, if x squared over y is an integer, but x over y is not an integer, take note of those nots, what, is, what of the following could be the values of x and y? Well, it tells you right here, x over y is not an integer. So I'm just gonna make sure that, I'm just gonna see which ones are going to be integers, and then we can eliminate those. An integer is not a decimal or a fraction. So if you get a decimal or a fraction, it's not an integer. <clears throat> so let's do the A. Let's see if A, one over one, that is an integer, so he's out. All right, the next one, three over two, that is not an integer, so that's okay. Um, four over two, that ends up being an integer, and it says x over y is not an integer. Well, here it is an integer, so that's out. Um, the next one, six over four, that's going to be 3 over 2, so that is an integer. So that one stays in. And then the last one, 9 over 3, is 3, so that one's out. All right, um, which of the following could be the value? Now we just need to see between these two, if we square x and divide it by y, which one's going to be an integer. So they really are testing your definition if you know the definition of an integer. So make sure you study those definitions this week. There's going to be a quiz on that, so make sure you know it. it's really important. So I'm going to take and I'm going to um, square the, let's see, x is not an inch. Okay, I'm going to square b, so I'm going to get 9 over 2. That is, it, it's supposed to be an integer. That's not an integer, so that one's out. And then let's take the next one, 36 divided by 4. That one is an integer, so this is our winning answer. Okay, that's just knowing whether something's an integer, and I worked from the answers and found the solution. All right, next one. The equation of the line y equals negative, that doesn't even matter that they have the equation of the line y equals negative 2x plus 6. Which of the following is the graph of this? Now, the thing to keep in mind is if you ever have a graph of an absolute fu value function, if you have to graph any absolute value, it's always going to look like a V. It's going to be in different places, but the shape is going to be a V. So if you know absolute values, graphs of absolute values always look like a V, you can cross out this one and you can cross out this one. Okay, now there's uh, some other things you want to know. If, if it's a positive before the absolute value, it's going to go an upward V. If it's a negative before an absolute value, it's going to be a downward V like that. So this one is out because it's positive in front of your absolute value. Now we have it down to two choices. Um, you're going to make yourself, even if you didn't know anything else that I did, you can make yourself a little chart and just check some points and see if it works. So let's just check, um, let's just put zero in for x and see if we get six out for y. So I'm gonna put a zero in for x and I do get a six out for y. Um, we have here, if we're looking at the graph B, one, two, three, if I put a three in for x, let's see if we get it out of zero for y. So two times, negative two times three is six, I mean, it is six, negative six plus six is zero. So the points on this graph so far do work. Let's just check a point on this graph. Um, this one, if you put in, um, <clears throat> if you put a three, you don't get a zero. So this graph, these points up here don't work down here, so it doesn't work. So this is your solution. If you don't know anything else I did, just know absolute values are Vs. A negative before an absolute value is an upside down V. Um, just pick the points. Like I picked this point and I put it in to see if it worked. And I put this point in to see if it worked and they both worked. So I, and this one down here, if you would have put a zero in, you would have gotten the six. But if you put the three in here, you wouldn't have got this value up here. So this is the only right one. Okay, last page. Hopefully I have this page. Whoops, and I don't, yes I do. Okay, hold on, let me just see if I can increase the size of this guy. Um, I don't think I can do that. 
Yep, we're going to have to work in minuscule proportions here. Okay, the right circular cylinder above has a diameter D and a height of H. Of the following expressions, which represents the volume of the smallest rectangle box, rectangular box that contains the cylinder? Okay, just think of this cylinder thing as a cake, and you're going to put it in a box. So if we put a box around it, it's going to look like this, just like a box. It's going to be three-dimensional, though, because boxes are three-dimensional. So... You, they want to know um, the volume of the box. You know, need to know the formula for volume. It's length times width times height. This one's actually pretty easy. If you have the, the circle, it, the circle, the diameter is going to be the same going across this way as it is going across here. Picture makes it look smushed. So the, the width of the box is going to be D, and the length of the box is going to be D as well. So it's going to be... Um, D times D, and the height is H. And so your answer is going to be the volume is D squared H. I can't even tell because it's so small which letter the answer is, but I'll look in my book here, and it's um, B, D squared H. Okay, um, I'm going to have to read this from my book. The square of X is equal to 4 times the square of Y. Okay, this one is pretty much a algebra, an algebra problem. I'm going to do it the algebra way, and then we'll see if there's a faster way to do this. The square of x, square of x is equal to 4 times the square of y. And then it says x is 1 more than twice y. Twice y plus 1. Really, I would probably just do this. I mean, you can pick um, what is the value of x. So I would guess maybe you could plug it in. Um, mm, I don't know if you can plug it in or not. Let's just solve it algebraically. Since x equals 2y plus 1, I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it in for x. If you know how to do this, you can do it fairly quickly. So here we go. I'm going to have to look to see if there's a faster way to do this, though equals, I'm just substituting 4y squared. The key with this one is you're going to FOIL it. You, you're not going to say 4y squared plus 1. That is not FOILing it. You would want to do 2y plus 1 times 2y plus 1. The binomial is squared. So you're going to get 4y squared plus 4y plus 1 <clears throat> equals 4y squared. Can this be that easy or did I make a mistake? Okay. So the y squareds are going to cancel out like that. So you get 4y equals negative 1, and y equals negative 1 fourth. This is where you have to go back and see if, uh, make sure you answer the question. It says, what is the value of x? So this is y. Don't stop there. You can see that they have that answer right there for those of you that would stop there. So take y, go back, put it up right in there. So we're going to say x equals 2 times negative 1 fourth plus 1. So it's going to be x equals negative 1 half plus 1. x equals 1 half. And so that is your answer. Um, let me just look in another book and see if there's a shortcut to that real quick. Um, no, the other book says that there's not a shortcut either. Okay, that's why it's at the end of the thing. It's, it's really an easy algebra problem. It's just a little bit more time consuming than we want at the end of the test. Okay, let's do the last one. In the XY coordinate planes, line L and Q are perpendicular. Um, if line L contains a point zero, zero, and two, one. So let's just draw ourselves a little coordinate plane. Um, I don't think I can make my line turn see, I need a black line, not a white line. Oh, well, we're going to have to go with the white line here. All right, the white line. Let me see something here. Hmm. It doesn't want to give me another color, so we're just going to have to go with that. Okay, so it says that line, one of them goes through, line L contains point zero, zero and 2, 1. So 1, 2, 1. 
All right, so this is line L. So this, again, is another rather time-consuming problem. So this is line L. I have to pretend a little bit. Let's put our endpoints on. And this is 2, 1 right here. We can find the slope of line L, right? Slope of line L is going to be rise one, run two. So the slope is going to be two. You can just count because you're going from zero, zero to two, one, you would go up one over two. So your slope is two. Okay, I'm gonna read the rest of the problem here. Line Q contains the point two, one as well, and it is perpendicular um, let's see, the two lines are perpendicular. Line Q contains the point 2, 1. So let me just draw in a line Q as best as I can with white lines. All right, so there's Q. This is Q. Whoops, having writing problems. This is line L. Okay, line 2 has this point and it has, it's perpendicular to this. Now you should know that line Q, it's perpendicular, so the slope, it's perpendicular line L, so it's going to be the negative reciprocal, so it's going to be negative one half. And you have for Q, you have it also goes through the points 2, 1. So we're going to take our little equation. You can either use the point slope or you can use the slope intercept form. We have, this is our X and this is our Y and this is our M. We can find B. So we would say 1 equals negative 1 half times 2 plus 1, our b. And so you get 1 equals negative 1. Um, let's see. Did I make a mistake there? Plus b. It looks like I did. Let's see what I did wrong here. Um, 2, negative 1 plus b. I'm getting b equals 2, which is not right. Hold on one second. I get to the last problem and mess up. Um, 0t. I'm not sure. You guys are probably look, looking at it saying blaring, seeing a blaring problem. Oh, I know what I did. Um, points 2, 1. I totally see what I did. Okay. It was very blaring. Okay, so y is 1. It's negative 1 half times 2, there we go, plus b, um, okay, I just filled the same thing in that I just did, okay, skip that method, let me do the other way, something is really blaring, but I'm just missing it for some reason, hold on, let's do it this, let's use, use this formula, y minus y1 equals m times Oh, blaring from the beginning. This is a this is a really bad problem for me right now. I can't rewind my video, so you're just gonna have to endure through it. Um, the slope is rise over run run, so it's rise one run two. You guys are probably like yelling at me the whole time I was doing this problem. So the slope of the perpendicular line is gonna be negative two. The point what that we want is two one that it goes through. Let's try this again. Y equals mx plus b. So we get 1 equals negative 2 times 2 plus b, yay. So we get b equals 5, and that's what they're asking for. They want to see um, what the y-intercept is because they want this point right here. We, need, we know it's 0, and then what's, where does it cross, which is the y-intercept? It's going to be 5, so your answer is 5. Okay, that's it for section 2.